Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute's uh, first event of the new year, um, uh, are we 2015. Uh, so, happy new year to you all. Salino Mubarak. I just learned it in Chinese, but I've forgotten. <laughs> I, sound like, I sound like the Pope, don't I? <laughs> no, but it's great to see you all. I'm, uh, I apologize about the, the weather in this room. It's a bit cold, but it'll all heat up with intellectual um, stimulation soon. Um, I, I do feel I ought to say, um, although it's, it's, it's nice to wish you a happy new year, it's worth marking the fact that we're all a bit mournful, pondering and, and uh, pensive today on, 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 in, a, in, an, in a place that is a public forum for free speech and, and intellectual stimulation. We do mourn because we're part of the system, the, the, the events of, of, of Paris yesterday, which are so shocking to us all. Um, that said, if I could just move on to a piece of uh, um, housekeeping, uh, which is simply that we have an extra event, actually, which, is not which was not originally in the calendar, taking place on, on the 12th, which is Monday. Uh, the, uh, the one of the I think it's the title the Montenegrin Premier, Premier Prime Minister is coming to give a talk on on stability and development. Uh, the point and we're doing that with MOFA with the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, but the point I'd I'd like you to note is that we start at six rather than six thirty. You probably all in, in, intuitively come at six thirty. We we're starting that early. Um, Without further ado, I'm very pleased to inter introduce uh, uh, this evening's distinguished guest from who's flown over from NYU, New York, Jonathan Haidt, who is the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at New York University's Stern School of Business. He received his PhD in social psychology from the University of Pennsylvania uh, in 1992, uh, after which he did postdoctoral research at the University of Chicago and in Orissa, India, on the east coast of India. He taught at the University of Virginia for 16 years, where he conducted the research, which was written up largely in The Righteous Mind, one, one of his two books. I believe that's the case. And his research focuses on morality, its emotional foundations, cultural variations, and developmental trajectories, if one can say. He is the co-developer of Moral Foundations Theory and of the research site yourmorals.org. He uses his research to help people understand and respect the moral motives of their enemies. She was very appropriate today. Uh, see, for example, his 2008 TED Talk. Haidt is the author of two books, The Happiness Hypothesis, uh, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdoms, which was published in 2006, and The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, published in 2012, which became a New York Times bestseller. He was, named, he was named one of the top global thinkers by Foreign Policy magazine and one of the top world thinkers by Prospect magazine. Um, his three TED Talks have been viewed by more than three million people, um, which is an extraordinary number. Uh, tonight's talk is capitalism, is is capitalism moral? Old and new tales. Capitalism has long been a lightning rod for moral controversy in the West from the 19th century origins of socialism to the 2011 Occupy movements. As many new variants, variants of capitalism flourish, what are the moral controversies arising in Asia these days? This lecture presents research on moral psychology as applied to capitalism in the West and then turns to a discussion on the relationship of capitalism and morality in non-Western nations. Please welcome John, Jonathan Haidt. Well, thank you so much, Philip. Thank you, everyone. Um, it is a, a great pleasure to be here. It's particularly exciting because uh, it makes two things very real that were not so real before. Uh, the first is the fact that 
I now work at a global network university. I, I joined NYU three years ago, and I kept hearing that term, uh, and it didn't really mean anything. It was this uh, thing that you heard about, but it didn't really impact my life in any way. And then now and then people would go, and they'd come back, and they'd say, wow, that was really interesting. You, you've got to go. And well, so finally, I'm here. And it's wonderful. It's especially because you know, I heard so much about it before when you didn't really have your own campus, uh, but a campus is so much more than a program, especially when it's this gorgeous campus. This is a really nice campus, and I'm, you know, I, I love living in New York, but you know, our quarters are kind of cramped and crowded and a little dark. This is really nice here. So um, it's, it's wonderful to have that really become so, so real for me. The other thing that has just become so real in the last few days is that many of the, the abstractions Ah, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm hearing a vo uh, thin voices. Now I understand, it's the simultaneous translation in Arabic, right? Okay, I thought it was some sort of something in my head. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I've been, you know, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a scholar. I sit in my office and I read books and I write about things. And I write about capitalism and development and I show these graphs. Um, and in the last few days, these ideas have become so much more clear and vivid. Let me show you what I mean. This is my favorite graph in the world. This graph really transformed me. I think it's the most important graph um, in, in the world. Here's what it shows. It doesn't look very dramatic, but just wait. Uh, this shows uh, GDP per capita in constant $1990 from the year zero through, uh, well, this goes up to 1950. And what you see there is that from the year zero through about 1500, everybody on all continents was living on roughly a dollar a day. But, but GDP was about $400 per capita per year. So leaving aside you know, a few kings and princes, everybody was dirt poor. And then you see this little bump up on the blue line. That blue line represents Western Europe when it developed mercantile capitalism. That means they developed corporate law and ways of pooling money to build ships and send them on missions to the Indies. It didn't make anything new, but by moving stuff from one place to another, it created value. And so Europe gets richer, and you can see it there. It gets like two or three times as rich, and that's a really big effect, except that the scale is so compressed, as you'll see in a moment. Um, so things go along like that. Western Europe leads the world in development. And then in the uh, uh, early 19th century, we get industrial capitalism. The Europeans figure out how to make things using coal power, water power originally, and then coal power. And once they learn to create factories and make stuff, then GDP per capita skyrockets in uh, Western Europe and especially uh, in the United States. The United States really masters the form first of generating mass prosperity, lifting almost everybody, uh, or the great majority, out of poverty. And this is an enormous transformation. And if you don't think that this is dramatic, uh, this is taking us from the year zero through 1950. Look what happens in the 50 years after 1950. And it's not just the USA and Western Europe. Now it's Japan, the first non-Western nation to do it. And this data only goes up to 2000. It's based on a particular data set from Angus Madison, who passed away. And so I don't have the numbers. But obviously, if we could just graph the next 13 years, China would be up in here. India would be up in here. Um, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is rising up in here. Everybody is, GDP is shooting up everywhere. Poverty is plummeting. This, when I, when I saw this, I arrived at the Stern School three years ago, and when I saw this graph, it really changed the way that I thought. But that was just conceptual. It was like, wow, look at that graph. Isn't that cool? Well, now I'm here um, uh, in the UAE, and um, now I see what it actually looks like in real life. And it looks like this. Just, you know, I'm like, here's the graph. See, it's low, it's low, it's low, and then bang, it just goes up. You know, and, and if you think, uh, you know, that's impressive. I look at this graph, you know, well, I could, it's, you know. So I, I took my, uh, my, my children, my wife and kids, uh, we went to Dubai the other day, and, you know, we went to the, the top of the, of the Burj Khalifa, or as, as they seem to call it over there, they seem to call it the Burj Dubai for some reason. But um, we went to the top of the Burj Khalifa, um, and it was just extraordinary um, to see how that city has been transformed, to talk with taxi drivers and others uh, about the opportunities, the economic opportunities. Um, so suddenly it just became so much more 
real. Um, and so I'm, I'm so pleased that, that you've invited me here, that I've been invited to speak at NYU Abu Dhabi. It has really changed the way I think. Um, it's given me some real awe experiences uh, and helped me to, to think about capitalism and morality, uh, which is the subject of, of my next book. I'm actually here uh, and, and traveling across Asia to do research uh, for that book. Um, now, of course, there, there could be a uh, uh, there, is, there are dark sides to this graph. I don't want to just make it seem as though, oh, capitalism is ethical. Look, people get rich. Obviously, there are other issues. There's exploitation of workers. There are environmental problems. And we'll, come to, we'll, we'll talk about those uh, later as well. Um, all right. Now, so um, let's talk about capitalism and morality. But first, let me find out who's here in the audience. First, raise your hand. I want to understand who, you know, where you're coming from. Um, raise your hand if you're an NYU student. NYU AD student. OK, we have a lot of students here. Raise your hand if you are uh, a faculty member or staff member here at NYU. OK, a number of those. Raise your hand if you are involved in business in any way. OK, a fair number of business people. Um, OK, so we've got a, a, diverse, uh, a diverse audience. I think I'll, I'll, I'll have uh, uh, things that will be useful to, to all of you. Um, let me also find out where this group is politically. Now, this, the, these, number, these labels may not make sense. <laughs> they may not make sense to some of you, and that's actually part of, part of what I'm hoping to figure out here. So uh, from those choices, pick one of those choices for you, if you can. And then please raise your hand if you would say that you are on the left, progressive, or liberal in the American sense. Please raise your hand high. OK, so a, a lot of people are on the left. Uh, what about being right on the right or conservative? Raise your hand. One, two, oh, no, there's more, OK. About six or seven. That's a lot more conservative than an audience back in New York would ever be. Um, <laughs> so we've got about, um, raise your hand. Because it's, it's a ratio of only about like maybe eight, seven or eight to one, which is very unusual in the academic world to have so many. Um, uh, raise your hand. OK, what if you are libertarian or liberal in the European sense? Libertarians, raise your hand. Wow, a lot more libertarians than conservatives. That's very interesting. Um, raise your hand if you'd say you're centrist or moderate. You're nowhere on, on, uh, on that. Not nowhere. You're, OK, very good. So we have a fair number of those. Um, and then raise your hand if these categories don't really make sense to you. Raise your hand. OK, so you're all divided up into different categories. But clearly, the largest group is, is on the left, it's followed by libertarians. And the least represented group is social conservatives. OK, thank you. That's what I needed to know. All right. Um, now, I'm going to talk about this word capitalism. Um, let's start with just how it feels to you. How does the word feel to you? I talk about capitalism and morality. Uh, you know, is that, is, does that strike you as an oxymoron? Does that strike you as, as a contradiction? So what are your overall associations? So decide whether you feel mostly good or, or whether you're negative or ambivalent. Raise your hand if you, if you, you know, capitalism just fills you with warm, fuzzy feelings. No, if it's overall a good feel, if you, it's a good word. Raise your hand if you think it's a good word. Raise your hand high. OK. And now the opposite. Raise your hand if you think it's bad or you're ambivalent. OK, so, uh, so it looks like it's about two-thirds bad, one-third good. I, some didn't vote, but all right. So, um, so this, again, well, no, wait, there's some libertarians. I bet there wasn't a, I hope there wasn't a single libertarian here who raised her hand for bad. Anyway, so um, this, this group is uh, ambivalent, uh, leaning negative, uh, ambivalent or negative towards capitalism. Um, and, and here's some data on American attitudes in general from Pew. Um, overall, socialism, Americans have a negative view of socialism. They have a slightly positive view, 50% to 40% of capitalism. But that is really split by left-right. Um, here's how the data breaks down in the US. Um, people who say that they're both conservative and Republican have a very positive view of capitalism, 66% positive, only 29% negative, and vice versa. Liberal Democrats like socialism. Um, uh, conservatives really hate uh, socialism, um, uh, and uh, liberals are evenly split on capitalism. So it, this is what we're fighting and arguing about in the US. It's what people are fighting and arguing about in Western Europe. I think it's less so in, in Asia, but I'll, I'll find out what the, I, I don't know yet what the, what the divisions are. But this is where we're kind of stuck in America, is fighting you know, more government, no, less regulation, let business run. Um, the U.S. is more uh, uh, favorable towards capitalism than most nations, but it's not at all an outlier. Uh, this is in response to the question, are people better off in a free market economy? And people in most countries say yes. Uh, well, in you know, Mex well, Mexico, Japan, 
Uh, there are a few countries where majorities say no, especially countries like Greece and Spain that are having a really tough time and, and you could say have been, well, it's complicated morally, but things are not working out very well there. Um, but the US is hardly the extreme in terms of having a positive view of capitalism. But you see that countries differ quite a lot, just as people within each country, or certainly within the US and within this room, um, differ. So it's a very controversial concept. I think it's arguably the most important concept um, out there in the world today, because if you get it right, your society flourishes, and if you don't, it doesn't. Um, so what is capitalism? Very briefly, just I think the, the Oxford English Dictionary's definition is fine. Um, it's an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. Um, people who are libertarians or people who are uh, very much uh, pro-capitalist often prefer to talk about the free market system instead. I mean, there are many different kinds of capitalism, but these days what we mean is uh, the free market system as opposed to more government regulation, control, and sometimes ownership. Um, this is certainly more than just business or commerce. Those things have been around for thousands and thousands of years without generating that skyrocketing prosperity. So it's a particular political and economic arrangement where when you put it together, especially if you have strong property rights, corporate law, so that you can have these emergent entities, these corporations that can do giant things, um, and high levels of economic freedom, then you get this mix. So that's what we're talking about here today. And the rest of my talk is going to be about these four questions. I'm going to raise these four questions about the relationships between capitalism and morality. I'll go through them uh, one at a time. So first, how does economic development change moral values. We are witnessing this incredible transformation of our planet in which wealth used to be just the province of the West, but now, you know, depending on how you count it, a billion people have been, you know, or more have been lifted out of poverty. And if trends continue, even if they slow down, as they're slowing down in China, even if they slow down, I, I mean, the world is being completely transformed, which guarantees that in almost all countries, certainly in Asia uh, or in any of these countries that are rapidly modernizing, it almost guarantees that almost every child is raised in a radically different environment than his or her parents were. The change is that rapid, much more so than we've ever experienced in the United States. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen in the UAE uh, as the, you know, the, the city, these, these incredible cities just spring up from nowhere? The population gets urbanized. What's going to happen? Um, well, there are a number of theories about this. Uh, after the Berlin Wall fell, Francis Fukuyama wrote an essay called The End of History, in which he said that we may be witnessing the end point of mankind's ideological evolution. There is no alternative to Western liberal democratic capitalism. And this is the point at which, eventually, in the 21st century, all countries will converge. That was his thesis. Well, there's been a lot of history since 1989. And uh, uh, the, the future of liberal democratic capitalism is not nearly as assured as it might have seemed uh, back then. Um, Fukuyama followed it up more recently, a few years ago, with a book um, in which he, he essentially asks, the question of the book is, how can countries get to Denmark? is the way he puts it. How can we all become like Denmark? By which he means, not that we're, you know, have a small, cold, dark nation, um, <laughs> but stable, peaceful, prosperous, inclusive, and honest societies. Good political institutions, good governance, those sorts of things, he says. Um, well, so the, the big question in this literature, it's a, it's a large literature coming out of sociology and economics that I'm just learning now, but the big question is, is there really one path? Is there basically, this is the way forward? Or are there many paths? People want to know. It's very important to know this. Um, uh, does each culture follow its own path, drawing on its own values and traditions? It's a really crucial question, especially uh, for, a, you know, for a country such as this one, which is so self-consciously planning how to move forward. It's important to understand what are the available paths. One of the best papers on this, a classic paper, it's from 2000, but it's a really, really good paper. It's just, it, I've just been fascinated by it in the last couple months, um, by Ron Englehart and Wayne Baker. Um, and you don't need to read the abstract. I'll tell you what, they, they, they run the World Values Survey, which is a very large survey given to in 65 countries originally back in 1980. Now it's up over 100 countries. So every six or seven years, they do a representative sample in, you know, now it's 100 countries, gigantic survey of people's values. And here's what they find. Um, when they 
aggregate all the um, all the va the specific values. You know, what do you think about you know women's equality and and you know, religion and government and all sorts of questions. When they aggregate them by nation and then they do factor analysis on the aggregated scores, they find that they can represent the world in two dimensions. You can plot each country in two dimensions that captures a lot of the variance. And here are the two dimensions. So. Uh, many countries are at the, at the traditional end. They tend to value um, religion, family, nation, um, and, um, uh, and then the other ext uh, extreme of this dimension is the secular rational as religion, ten as religion begins to fade out uh, and rational values, rational uh, thinking, um, uh, sort of a more calculative mindset uh, comes in. So that's one dimension that countries vary on. The second is survival values versus self-expression values. When life is dangerous, when you don't know uh, whether there will be food tomorrow or whether the secret police will abduct you uh, uh, tomorrow night, um, when survival is not assured, people are really focused on getting resources, protecting their resources, protecting their family. They're very distrustful. They're less happy. But when life gets stable, when life gets Denmarky, you might say, um, people put aside those values and they get what Englehart calls post-material values in which they value quality of life. It's not so much how much money you have, that doesn't matter anymore. Um, it's quality of life, it's can I be, am I free to be me, am I free to express my values? So those are the two dimensions and if you plot all the countries, here's what it looks like. Now I know you can't read the specific countries but I'll just guide you through it. In the upper right quadrant we have Protestant Europe, we have Denmark, actually Sweden is the most extreme but in, that, in, in, this, in the graph. But you know, the Scandinavian countries, we have Norway, uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, Finland. So those countries are very high on self-expression and on secular rational, very little religion there. Uh, in the bottom left are the Islamic countries. Um, this is, well, Zim, well, Zimbabwe is in the middle of that, but uh, other than Zimbabwe, it's Pakistan, Jordan, Morocco, uh, Bangladesh, uh, so, so the Islamic countries and the African countries are, are basically in the survival values and traditional values. Um, uh, the English-speaking countries, the Anglosphere, Britain is there, USA is there, Canada are all over here. So they're very high in self-expression, but not as secular atheist as Scandinavia, still a lot more religion in some of the English-speaking countries. But I think it's this, and I'll show, this is such a, an interesting table to think about. There's so much that you can get from this table. One thing to note, I think is very interesting, is here we are at NYU Abu Dhabi. Well, um, you know, they, we don't, they don't have the UAE here, but this, the Islamic world is about as far from, uh, you know, from, from these countries as could be, and it's about as far, well, it's not as far from the USA as could be, because the USA is more religious. But the point is, we have quite a span. Obviously, I mean, well, people are from, here from all over the world, but the fact that it's working is, is really wonderful uh, and, and promising. Okay, now you might have noticed, if you looked at those countries, that there's a kind of a wealth gradient. Um, all the countries in this corner are poor, all the countries in this corner are rich. So you might think, well, maybe it's just that as you get rich, you just move to Denmark. Um, <laughs> but, but what Engelhardt and his colleagues have found is that it's actually a little bit more interesting than that. Here's the way, here's the way it works. Um, First, countries go through the transition from agriculture to industry, because originally every country was agricultural. There was no industry. And when everybody's agricultural, they're down in there. And as they begin to have factories and, and, and trade and, and much more wealth, the first thing that happens is religion fades out. They become less interested in tradition, in ritual, in religion, um, and they become more interested in um, um, in, uh, well, in, in material success. They develop materialist values and they become, again, more rational. Like, hmm, all this religious stuff, this is taking me away from work. I could earn money if I was not, not praying so often. So you get this more secular, rational, calculating uh, uh, approach there. Um, but then as countries move beyond um, uh, industry and into the service sector, you know, in America, very few people work in manufacturing. I'm not very, but it's, it's, it's I forget what the number is, but it's you know, way down from where it was in the 50s and, and, and 60s. Um, as people move into the service industry, then they move to the right. Um, because now uh, things are safer. The, these are more skills about dealing with people rather than things, rather than you know, machines. Um, so y the actual shape, the, sort of the path that countries go in is this interesting curve. They kind of go you know, up. It's not, not it's like, it's sort of, they sort of go like this. 
on average. And so if we look at this again, as I said, it's sort of, you know, I, sh I should have drawn it as a curve, but it's, there's a general movement. It, you don't go straight to Denmark, you kind of go this way. And that's why it's interesting that this quadrant is empty. No country goes, no, no country goes there and then there. Um, so this is sort of the general way that things go. So on this question of one path or many, uh, to cut to the chase, here's their summary. Uh, what they say in this article um, is, uh, um, we find evidence of both massive cultural change and the persistence of distinctive cultural traditions. So economic development is associated with shifts away from absolute norms and values toward values that are increasingly rational, tolerant, trusting, and participatory. Um, also, specifically, gender roles always change and always change in this, well, you'll see it in the same direction. Um, but despite these general trends that are, that are generally true for all countries, this, the direction of movement, they say cultural change is path dependent. The broad cultural heritage of a society leaves an imprint on values that endures despite modernization. So we don't all converge on Denmark. Rather, what they say is that mass values have not been converging over the past three decades. Norms concerning marriage, family, gender, and sexual orientation show dramatic changes. But virtually all advanced industrial societies have been moving in the same direction at roughly similar speeds. This has brought a parallel movement without convergence. So that's really interesting. We're all changing. We're all changing in similar ways. But you know, 20 years from now, We'll all be more in this direction, but we'll still be different from each other. We're not all coming to the same point, but we are moving in the same direction. You wouldn't have sort of guessed that if you didn't have that, this data to, to look at. Um, so that's all I'll say about question one. How does economic development change moral values? And I, I hope you'll see this now. Those of you, if you go back to your home countries, if you look at how things are changing here in the UAE, I hope you'll, you'll see the way things are changing, the way values are changing. Question number two. How does ideology influence economic thinking? I just put asterisks there because this is the, um, the one that, that I'll be talking about the most. It's the one in which my, my own research is, is most directly relevant. Um, so um, econo um, economic thinking, it's very important for countries to have good economic thinking. Um, and, and no end of trouble and poverty is caused by bad economic policies. The key to understanding bad economic policies is this wonderful concept I just encountered last spring for the first time called um, a wicked problem. So wicked problems, it's not like problems of you know, wicked people or witches or something like that. It's, um, well, the best way to understand it is in contrast to a tame problem. So these two uh, professors of policy and planning, uh, uh, Riddle and Weber, wrote this wonderful article in which they talk about tame problems are things like curing cholera. OK, it's really hard technically. You know, maybe sequencing the genome. I mean, there's all kinds of really hard problems technically, but the problem just sits there and lets the experts work on it. It might take 20 years, but the problem doesn't reach into their minds and twist their thinking. It just sits there, and gradually, incrementally, they make progress. But now let's look at a problem like poverty. Poverty is a wicked problem because it doesn't just sit there. It, it, it activates the experts' moral values. As, um, so there's this wonderful article by Nordhaus and Schellenberger that applies the, the wicked, uh, this wicked problem framework to politics. And they say, um, explaining Riddle and Weber, they say, uh, experts could only define wicked problems in relationship to background solutions, which are themselves shaped by underlying values and a vision of the good society. So whatever an economist wants to be the case, whatever his political and moral values are, that's going to shape his understanding of the problem and his, di and his diagnosis and prescription. As a result, disagreements over social and environmental policy cannot be resolved by experts who, in many ways, make them more intractable. This is a class of problems where the more experts study them, the more they generate white papers that extremists on both sides can cite and say, see, we're right and you're wrong. No, we're right and you're wrong. And that's why we have such trouble making progress on basic economic questions. Um, another way to look at it is that for tame problems, we've got good tools. The experts use the tools. And they work the same for everybody. But with wicked problems, it's like playing croquet in Alice in Wonderland, where she's trying to play. She's holding a live flamingo to hit a live hedgehog. And the tools are moving around. It doesn't work. But in policy analysis, 
the tools are a lot more helpful. The tools are actually sort of twisting themselves to help you reach the conclusion that you want to reach. And that's why I asked about politics, because politics and ideology is so important in understanding the problems of economic thinking. Now, I don't want to overstate things. Economists do often reach some consensus <clears throat> on, on difficult issues. Uh, but the fact remains that for any complicated question, you know, would raising the minimum wage help the poor? Would it, or would it hurt the poor? <clears throat> for any um, uh, complicated policy question, you can find experts on both sides that will give you all kinds of arguments for why their side is right. Um, now, um, <clears throat> um, the reason why they don't agree about economic policy, it's not just sort of random disagreements. It's actually organized around these two stories about capitalism that they hold to. So people on the left and the right have very different underlying stories, underlying um, uh, narratives about what capitalism is and what modern history is that has brought us <clears throat> to this point. Um, so I've been, um, um, pardon me, let me just, <clears throat> sorry, I have come down with a cold, and so that is interfering uh, here. <clears throat> All right, so I joined the, the Stern School three years ago, um, right at the time of Occupy Wall Street. And, um, and I was just hearing these stories all around me, um, you know, the, about how capitalism is so evil. No, capitalism is the best thing in the world. And, and so I thought, um, it's so useful to know these stories. I want to make them accessible to everybody. I want everybody to know these stories, that you'll see them when you read the newspaper, when you hear people on, the, uh, on, both, on the various sides talking. You'll, you'll, you'll hear their implicit story. Now, these stories are not things that we wrote ourselves. We often can't even tell the story. But we imbibe them as we grow up. We drink them in from, from our local surroundings, uh, from the community that you're raised in, from the school that you go to. Um, you drink them in. And then when you, when you um, come across facts that seem to support your story, you get this little flash of, of, of recognition, of pleasure. It feels good to find facts that support your story. And when someone tells you about a study or a finding that seems to disprove your story, it's really uncomfortable. And you want to either knock it down or avoid that person. You really don't want to talk to people who are going to challenge your underlying implicit story. Um, so I, I, uh, um, I, just, uh, I thought it would be helpful to have these stories made visible. So I hired a video production company to animate them. I wrote out the script. And if we're ready to play the sound, um, I will now press play. They're about 90 seconds long. And just watch them and just see how you feel, which one resonates with you. Here's the first. Once upon a time, work was real and authentic. Farmers raised crops, and craftsmen made goods with their own hands. But then, capitalism was invented, and darkness spread across the land as the smokestacks of the Industrial Revolution covered everything in soot. The capitalists became ever more skilled at extracting productivity from workers and pocketing the gains from their labor. The workers eventually fought back by unionizing, in the early 20th century, as the brutality and stupidity of capitalism were exposed, many governments granted workers some protection from the predators. Democratic welfare states were born. But the capitalists and their right-wing cronies were unrelenting. And in many countries, they have destroyed the unions, slashed regulations, and given the corporations free reign to exploit at will. So the rich get richer, the rest of us get poorer, our democracy gets weaker, and the planet gets hotter. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight against global capitalism and the super predators it has unleashed upon us. So, OK, so how did that feel to you? OK, just <laughs> I'm guess. well, OK, I'll, I'll show you my guess as to who clapped in just a moment. OK, here's the second story. Once upon a time, almost everyone was a peasant, a serf, or a slave. Kings and feudal lords took most of what people produced, so nobody had much reason to work hard. But then, in the 17th century, capitalism was invented, and the liberation began. In England, Holland, and America, they discovered that when you give people property rights, the rule of law, and free markets, you turn on a switch in their hearts. People want to work when they can keep the fruits of their labor. They want to invent new products, provide for their children, and be useful to others. 
Free market capitalism enables them to do these things. In the 20th century, some countries embraced communism and centralized planning, always with the same result. Shortages of everything, including food and freedom. But countries that embraced capitalism have grown prosperous in a single generation. Yet, despite the evidence of history, the left-wing egalitarians are unrelenting. And whenever they get control of a government, their first target is economic freedom. The egalitarians don't want to live in a world in which people who create more value for others get to enjoy more wealth for themselves. They'd rather that everyone be equal and equally poor. It is now the duty of every decent person to join the fight to protect capitalism and to extend its blessings to all of humankind. Okay, let's hear it from the... Uh... <laughs> Oh, I should just have an applause meter to do, to do this and see. Okay, so here's my question. Um, those, just those of you who self-identified as being on the left, so, so just for, to everybody decide which story you prefer, which one feels better or feels more right to you. Just those who identified as being on the left, raise your hand if you prefer story one about exploitation. Raise your hand high. Okay, and those on the left who prefer story two about liberation. Okay, so big effect. So people who are on the left, really prefer story one. They, or they think that's the more accurate one. Um, there's only six conservatives here, but actually it's the libertarians who are the more relevant group. So conservatives and libertarians, just those of you who raised your hand for that, raise your hand if you prefer story one about exploitation. Raise your hand high. Okay, a few. And raise your hand high if you prefer story two. Okay, so we have a big effect here. There's a big split. Uh, obviously, um, as I showed you the data before, um, people are split. Left, right is very split about capitalism, and that's the point. Um, people on the left and the right have different, they, they think it means something different. They think history is different. They think economics is different. They think morality is different when it comes to capitalism. And that's why this is such, economic problems are so wicked because what we believe drives what we perceive. Let me give you a simple demonstration of that. Um, so what's, you, you look at this, what do you see? Uh, raise your hand if you see three partially eaten pizzas, if that was your first, first reaction. Okay, and raise your hand if you see a triangle sitting on three circles. Okay, so the reason why this illusion, or this, I'm sorry, I gave it away. The reason why this image is so compelling um, is because most people can see, the, can you make out the slight edge there? Most people can see a little bit of the edge there, right? Raise your hand if you, if you can see a faint edge there, right? Okay, so I gave it away by saying it's an illusion, and watch, I will make the edges go away by simply covering two of the circles. No more edge, they're not there but your brain is guessing what that likely is. And then you tr you know, your brain in very low level processing circuits is trying to see in the random noise an edge and it amplifies the black white fluctuations on your retina and it creates edges that are not there. So you have to put them back. Okay, so that's a, a demonstration using perception of something very simple. But of course, if we get to more complicated economic problems, um, it's, uh, it becomes even more intense. So. Um, Many of you have heard of the Rorschach inkblot test. The idea was give people an ambiguous figure and then let their unconscious project onto it whatever, whatever it wants to see there. Uh, now, it turns out the Rorschach doesn't actually do that, but I have a much better Rorschach test for you. There, what do you see? Do you see the greatest economy, economist of the 21st century who wrote the most important book? Or do you see just another uh, left-wing uh, left French intellectual who wants a 90% tax rate on the rich? Um, here's another Rorschach test for you. Um, this graph shows how uh, the incomes of the various quintiles of, in the United States have fared since 1979. If you set that to zero, uh, the top 1% has gone way, way up, whereas the bottom fifth and middle fifth have only gone, they've gone up a little, but nothing compared to the top. So, so those are the economic facts, although it turns out those aren't even the facts because if you're on the left or the right, you dispute them. But do you see injustice? Do you see unfairness in that line? Or, you, or do you just see, well, you know, globalization, winner take all markets, this is just what happens. So depending on what your politics are, you will see injustice in this or you will just see a statement of, of interesting economic trends. Here's another one. Um, so Paul, Paul Krugman has been, um, has been writing for a long time. He's been just pulling his hair out at the austerity 
um, people in Europe, at the, uh, the, the preference of many European economists and uh, p politicians for dealing with an economic downturn by cutting spending, exactly the opposite of, of Keynesian economic principles. And you know, he's been writing about this for so many years, and uh, about a year, year and a half ago, he, wrote, um, he did some really interesting moral psychology. He said, some people, some powerful people, have a visceral sense that suffering is good, that we must pay a price for past sins. Some of them see the crisis as an opportunity to dismantle the social safety net. So he's saying, as an economist, I can't understand what they're doing, they're insane. It must be that they're so moralistic that they want people in these countries like Greece to suffer. They will only feel good if those people suffer because they deserve it. Um, that's his hypothesis. And you know, I think it's a, a very, as a, somebody who studies moral psychology, I think it's a very interesting hypothesis. And after I read it, I realized, actually, I have the data to test that. Because I run a, um, I run a research collaborative. I co-run a research collaborative at yourmorals.org. We've had about 400,000 people have taken our surveys. We have over 100 surveys that we've put up there over time. And so I looked through our surveys to find specific items that tested Krugman's specific claims about how left and right are different here. And here's, here are three items that really do the job nicely. So, um, so what this is, is when people come to the site, they register as being very liberal or on the left or very conservative or wherever they are. And so one of our items was, the world would be a better place if we let unsuccessful people fail and suffer the consequences. That's very much what Krugman is charging of these uh, right-leaning economists in Europe. And sure enough, uh, people who are liberal reject that. People on the left really reject that. They think, no, that is just not true. Whereas people who are very conservative say, yes, that is true. Another question, life would have very little meaning if we never had to suffer. You know, that suffering is good, Krugman had said. Um, and people on the left don't, I mean, they're, they're, they don't accept it or reject it. But as people get more conservative, as we move to the right, they actually embrace it more. And so you know, if, if, Greek, if Greece suffers, if Greek people suffer, well, that's good. That, that, you know, there are some benefits to suffering. Um, lastly, it is usually better to show mercy than to take revenge. Here is one in which people on the left uh, are the ones who strongly endorse it, but as you get more conservative, it goes down to the right. So think about how government ministers would respond to an economic crisis. If they're on the left, they're going to say, oh my god, people are suffering. We've got to do things to help those people. Uh, and they would be inclined to do that even if there was ambiguity as to whether it would actually improve the economic situation. Whereas people on the right, their first instinct would be, well, you know, people overspent. They bought houses they didn't deserve. Let them suffer. It'll teach a lesson to people in the future. Um, so again, we, it's, it's, you know, all, uh, I mean, I, I'm no economist. It seems to me that Krugman is probably right. I think events have borne him out. So hundreds of millions of people in Europe are suffering uh, because of the moral psychology of some European leaders. Um, many econom some economists have recognized this. I won't read these quotes, but Gun Gunnar Myrdal uh, noted, basically stated the wicked problem thesis, that the questions are an expression of our interest in the world. They are at bottom valuations. Other economists, like Milton Friedman, um, say, well, sure, economists have uh, their, own, uh, their own values. But whatever my values are, before I, as an economist, want to see something done, I would like to know what the results are. I'm a pragmatic person. I'm not ideological. I favor policies that work. OK, well, everybody does. But the whole point of wicked problems is everybody thinks that their preferred policies are going to work. And furthermore, they think that they have worked. Because the data is always ambiguous. Not always. The data is usually ambiguous. So just the other day, I, mean, I was preparing this talk a few days ago. Um, and there was a um, columnist in the Washington Post who said, why, you know, why do countless studies show that the impact, it was about what, what's wrong with conservatives. And he says, countless studies show that the impact on low wage employment uh, uh, ranges from zero to small. So if you raise the minimum wage, studies after st study after study has shown that you know, it, the, the, the number of people who will be thrown out of work is trivial. Those, why do those conservatives deny reality? Um, and then, of course, the very next day, a, a libertarian economist writes back and says, this guy, uh, that columnist, gives the misleading impression that economists have reached a consensus. But contrary to Mr. Perlstein's suggestion, there are also countless studies that show results quite the opposite. So again, the more experts study the problem, the more data you can find to support whatever you want to believe. Um, that's the wicked problem issue right there. And this in includes almost all of the major problems that we study, that we're divided about, that we fight about, that our elections turn upon. Um, I just want to make, the, make a note that in 
in, the, in developing nations, in nations that have been rising rapidly in prosperity, the forecast is problems will get much more wicked for you in the coming decades. Riddle and Weber, Riddle and Weber say that in the 19th century in the West, it was mostly engineering problems. It was building roads and railways and sanitation. The problems were not wicked in the 19th century, but now all the problems are wicked. Because um, as they say, as people, as your population gets more educated, it becomes more opinionated, and they'll fight over things much more uh, than when they were uh, less wealthy and less educated. Um, also, rising, plur uh, I'm sorry, rising uh, pluralism. So all these things that are increasing in the UAE, for example, and those are, that's, those are good things. I mean, I'm glad that these things are increasing, but it's going to make the social milieu, it's going to make uh, uh, problems more contentious over time. All right, so that's all I'll say about the second uh, question. On to the third. <clears throat> um, is there a third story about capitalism? And, okay. Um, and uh, so I've, I've argued here that there are these two stories and that the experts um, get all, uh, con not confused, the experts uh, do bad work sometimes because they are uh, biased by the story that they endorse. And there's no way we're gonna get one group to simply endorse the other one's story. So might we come up with a third story that everybody could agree on? Might we find some ways to, to take this knowledge and use it to make the problems less wicked? I think that we can, but I don't think we have to start from scratch. I think we can actually make this third story out of the other two. Um, and here's, here's how it goes. Um, so let's see. Um, OK, so a, as I said, I joined Stern, I joined the business school uh, three years ago. And I hadn't really thought very much about business at the time. Um, and as I said, I came across this graph. And I was always hearing uh, uh, the dean of the school and all the, uh, you know, the business students always talk about creating value, creating value. Everybody's trying to create value. Um, and I really realized, wow, that's what it looks like. When people create value, well, you know, that's what this is. So you know, this business buzzword, what they always say in business schools, they're always talking about creating value. And it was from this graph that I realized that um, uh, creating value isn't just a business buzzword. It's actually a moral imperative. It is a good thing when everybody is engaged in creating value. Because, uh, if it's not obvious enough already, when those curves go up, look what goes down. This is the percentage of people living on, I think, $1.50 a day is the standard. Uh, roughly, a dollar, let me see, I think I have it down exactly. The point is that in eight, you can't see the years, but in 1820, 95% of all the people on the planet were living in extreme poverty. And by uh, 2010, only 21% of people on this planet are living in extreme poverty. This is arguably the most important event in human history. It is arguably the most important transformation in human history, in all the history of our species. But because it's been spread out over 200 years, a lot of people haven't noticed it. So take, for example, this guy, uh, Russell Brand. He has a, a new book out called uh, Revolution. Um, and in, uh, in this book, the actor Russell Brand offers his uh, thoughts on economics. He says, um, our system, capitalism, is designed to behave like this. It generated wealth for the wealthy and further impoverishes those with nothing. Asking it to behave differently is like asking a microwave to wash your car. OK, so this is pure story one. This is the exploitation story. But it's completely wrong. I mean, capitalism doesn't impoverish. You know, look, I mean, the fa I'll say the facts are obvious, but he'll see. Well, my, again, you see the point. You see the point. So I think you simply cannot start with the exploitation story. You can't start with that story and then try to you know, build off it or improve it. You have to start with the liberation story. I mean, the, 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 the basic history of the last 200 years is that when countries embrace markets and trade, prosperity goes up and poverty goes down. Um, and the way that, the way that um, uh, capitalism liberates is it creates environments that reward innovation. That's where the value comes from. It's not from slightly improving efficiency here and there. It's from these breakthrough innovations that just change a whole industry. That's what really does the heavy lifting of those rising curves. So capitalism liberates uh, by uh, enabling constant innovation. But that innovation includes ever new forms of exploitation. Business people are amazingly creative, insightful. They see opportunities. They seize them. Sometimes those opportunities aren't really about creating value for someone else. They're about exploiting uh, a, a trick of the system, a government law, uh, you know, uh, some sort of policy. And sometimes they actually end up hurting people. 
Um, so, you know, for example, you know, uh, during the Ebola uh, crisis, it turns out somebody had bought Ebola.com many years ago, just hoping that there'd be an outbreak. And when there was, he wanted to sell it back to whoever wanted it for $150,000. Uh, but that's not really the, the big problem. I mean, there's always little parasites and you know, people on the edges of, of good markets. I'm sure you've had the same thing if you go to a, a market you know, where most, most merchants are very honest, but you have some shady characters. The real problem, I think, going on in American capitalism, at least, um, is that we're moving away from this older model called stakeholder theory or stakeholder view of business. Uh, so stakeholder theory, it's, a, um, it's a, probably the major theory in business ethics developed by Ed Freeman at the University of Virginia. But it actually, it really just describes the way good business people have always run uh, their companies. It's the idea that business, of course, business is about competition, but it's actually a lot more about cooperation. In a business person's daily life, it's overwhelmingly about cooperation, not competition. You're cooperating with your employees, your customers, the people in your local community. So these are all the major stakeholders. And if you take the long view of your business, and you cultivate these relationships, in the long run, you will flourish. Your interests are not opposed. Sometimes they are. But usually, your interests are aligned. Um, uh, and when businesses take this view, the exploitation story becomes irrelevant because they don't want to exploit their stakeholders. They want to cultivate good relationships. But something's been happening, especially in the United States. And trends are usually such that it, it then spreads to other countries. We've been moving away from a stakeholder model of business to what's called the shareholder primacy model. In this view, the executive is not trying to cultivate all these relationships. The executive has one major relationship to the shareholders. He works for the shareholders. His job is to maximize the return to the shareholders. Milton Friedman has this famous line, uh, there is one and only one social responsibility of business, and that is to increase profits, uh, subject to obeying laws and, and other constraints. Uh, but it, this is a philosophical idea coming out of the, of, of the libertarian uh, circles, free market uh, circles, um, which has been spreading through business schools. And uh, people with these calculative, rational mindsets, the, they, 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 they uh, come out of business schools thinking, how can I ret increase returns to shareholders? Well, here are some ways to increase returns to shareholders. Squeeze the other stakeholders. You can always squeeze them and, and, and get some money out of them in ways that hurt them, but help your shareholders. So for example, um, there's been a, a rash of reports of uh, businesses really treating their workers badly in the United States, doing all sorts of tricks to garnish their wages, to hold back some of their wages, to charge them for different things. And I was talking with the, the um, uh, my driver last, uh, last night on the way back from Dubai. Uh, and he said, without prompting, he said exactly the same thing. He'd worked in construction. He'd worked in various, he was from, uh, from Kerala, from India. Uh, and overall, he liked working here very much. But over, many times, he'd been exploited, uh, especially in construction. They find ways of not paying you what they say that they will. Uh, I, I'm happy to report that he said that actually, it's the Emirati uh, business people don't do this to him. It's actually, he said, the Indian business. It's the, it's the companies that are not based here, that are really just here to make a profit and are not restrained by social connections. Um, so that right away points you to where some pro problems might be. Um, you can always squeeze your customers, especially by hiding safety defects. Why spend money on things that will keep them safe? Uh, as GM decided to do, they knew about this ignition switch defect many years ago. It would have cost them, I forget how many cents, you know, a dollar or two, uh, to, to change it. 30 people have died so far. Many more have been injured. And of course, it's a fiasco for GM and its shareholders. Because in the long run, when you sque that's the whole point. In the long run, when you treat your stakeholders badly, in the long run, it's going to come back and bite you. It's going to bite your shareholders. But people are short-sighted. They just want, they, they don't see this. Um, and you can always squeeze the local community, um, as many companies do. Why, uh, you know, let, let's, let's let them take the risks. Why should we spend extra to keep our, our chemical plant um, uh, safe, to put in extra safeguards? Why do that? The worst offenses, talking about the moral arguments against capitalism, the worst offenses, I believe, come against the suppliers. And this is particularly and increasingly true because of globalization. It's one thing when the people who are making the parts for your company live you know, a few miles away or even in, in a different part of your own country, and there's a free press to report on it. And that's the way things used to be. But now, the supply chain is almost always global. And you don't even know who it is, because there's contractors, subcontractors, subcontractors. So you've got plausible deniability. Um, 
This is an image of the Rana Plaza building in, uh, in, uh, near Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. And uh, it, it houses many businesses, including a number of, of garment, industry, garment businesses. Um, one day, it was in April, a year and a half ago, um, their cracks appeared in the building. And uh, the building was evacuated. Uh, and then some of the garment makers told their workers, OK, if you don't come back tomorrow, you're losing a month's pay. We've, we've got deadlines to make. We've got orders to ship. We are not shutting down just because some cracks appeared in the building. So most of these young women came back, and the building collapsed, and uh, uh, over 1,000 of them died. Um, so these sorts of, of uh, offenses against the suppliers, the people at the very bottom, at the very end of the supply chain, I think this is the most serious problem that we have um, uh, in capitalism today. Um, so uh, the conclusion I come to is that capitalism is indeed liberation, but it, it liberates by encouraging innovation, which always includes new forms of exploitation. And so what we need to strive for is dynamism. You have to have economic dynamism to get those curves going up, but you have to pay some attention to decency. And this is where people on the left, I think, are good critics, are, uh, have, have something uh, uh, important to contribute by saying, you, know, you, you can't just go for dynamism. You have to attend, at least in part, to the decency aspect. Um, I'll just give you one example of a way of pushing back. Um, uh, you, know, you can treat your employees badly, but now that we have this sites like Glassdoor, glassdoor.com, where employees rate their employers, well, if you treat your employees badly, they're going to give you bad reviews. Just like on, on eBay or Amazon or anything else, they're going to give you bad reviews. And then it's going to cost you more to hire. So it's now in your material self-interest to treat your employees better. Well, that's great. That's putting in a nice feedback loop that increases decency with no compromise uh, on dynamism. Um, actually, I'll skip that. Well, no, I'll tell you this one. This is actually quite important. Here's another way of, of getting more decency. So after the Rana Plaza collapse, um, my, my colleague in the Business and Society program, Mike Posner, um, he and his group, um, they, they brought together all the major players, the government people, uh, uh, business, the, the, the subcontractors, uh, representatives of the unions. They brought them together at NYU in New York um, for, a con for a meeting to figure out how can we raise standards in such a way that a firm that treats its workers well, isn't that a disadvantage? Because the, the Western brands, the companies, are squeezing the suppliers so hard that if anybody raises their price by a penny per shirt, they're going to lose the contract. But if everybody raises their standards together, they can do it. And that's what they did. So there are ways to increase decency without compromising uh, dynamism. So that's all I'll say about the third story of capitalism. I think we really can do it. Um, uh, and just finally, very briefly, uh, um, is capitalism ethical? So I think you can see from everything I've said that the answer depends on which story you endorse. So if you think that capitalism is exploitation, well, pick your moral theory. If you're a utilitarian, you're going to say, as Russell Brand did, no, it hurts lots of people. Well, what about global warming? Um, it does all sorts of bad things. If you're a deontologist and you, like Immanuel Kant, or you focus on duties and obligations, you're going to say, even if it does help people, we, shouldn't, we must not violate people's dignity. Or if you're a virtue ethicist and you think that morality is not about the effects that you cause, but about the kind of character that you develop, you're going to say, no, capitalism is terrible. It makes people selfish. Uh, but if you think that capitalism is liberation, well, play utilitarian. Oh my god, it, it's, it's created more utiles, more goodness than anything else in history. Uh, deontology, yes, people's free choice should not be violated. People should have, have the right to choose what they want to, to do. Um, and uh, if you're a virtue ethicist, you will say, yes, it does cultivate many uh, virtues, as, as Ben Franklin uh, talked about. Um, so in conclusion, I've talked to you about uh, four questions about the relationship between morality and capitalism. Um, and um, I, uh, I hope I've at least shed a little bit of light on, uh, on each of the four, given, uh, given some additional ways uh, to think about them. Um, Let's see. So uh, as I said, I think capitalism is the most important idea out there today, uh, the most important idea that we're talking about in our different societies. The Western developed nations are now fairly stagnant economically. Uh, it's not as clear that the formula developed in the West is, is the right formula. Um, the world is becoming a global laboratory for capitalism. Different countries are trying different things. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I think we have fantastic opportunities to learn from each other, to try different things, um, uh, to see what might work. Um, and again, the more we create these relationships, trade relationships, knowledge relationships, um, the better we all do. So uh, long live NYU Abu Dhabi and the Global Network University. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, Michael Kramer from Abu Dhabi the last 10 years. Uh, what do you think of the American practice of treating corporations as persons? Mm. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's an interesting sense in which they, um, I think corporations are fascinating because they are super organisms. Um, they are, uh, so evolutionary history is full of transitions in which disparate elements come to work together. You know, like um, you know, uh, prokaryotic cells merge together to form eukaryotic cells, and cells merge together to form animals. Animals merge together to form hives. So corporations are, in a sense, the logical next step for the human species in a, a larger form of organization. Um, uh, to the extent that it's a legal fiction, which was deemed helpful or necessary early on in the origins of corporate law, I think it's probably a good idea. But I am kind of horrified at the idea that then they get to kind of pick and choose, or rather the Supreme Court gets to pick and choose which rights of people they have, because clearly they don't have they should not and cannot have all the rights of people. And as the you know, signs you've seen around, I saw it Occupy Wall Street, um, you know, I'll, I'll accept that corporations are people when they execute one um, for <laughs> something like for committing crimes, whatever. So uh, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's a, just another example of how if you're, on the, if you're a libertarian, you're on the right politically, you're going to want to take the aspects that, it, actually, I shouldn't say that, I'm sorry, because actually libertarians are always telling me, no, we actually don't really like big business because they corrupt the process. We like markets. We like free and fair markets. And if you give corporations too much power, you actually corrupt the markets. So I think from most perspectives, actually, who does defend them? Nobody defends them on moral grounds, the idea of overly powerful large corporations. Hey, good evening. I'm um, Otto from NY Abu Dhabi. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, as the main claim from this kind of the first story, the immoral capitalist stories, the exploitation and all these sorts of things. How could the statistical uh, the data of uh, reducing the poverty could uh, rebuttal that story? Because it's not about how many poor people are left. It's more about the people who work uh, in, in that particular system being mistreated rather than them being poor, absolutely. Or I'm sorry, wait, are you saying that what matters is not the proportion, but the absolute number of people? Or are you saying what matters is how badly the workers are being treated? I don't know, it's not even, it's not even about the proportion. It's about, it's about the way uh, the whole thing functions. Like, the, uh, if someone feels that they have been exploited, mm -hmm. it cannot be measured in the numbers uh, how many okay. people are poor. So it sounds like you're taking a deontological position, which is to say, even if capitalism were to lift 90% of the world out of poverty, if some people are being exploited in the process, we shouldn't do it. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and even the okay. number that, okay, let's say 21% are left uh, mm -hmm. absolutely poor, right. it still wouldn't, uh, I mean, we, we, we still wouldn't say that the rest of them who got mm -hmm. elevated from the poverty, they are not still being exploited. Mm -hmm. Right. So, okay. one, so I'm going to yeah, be. I'm going to guess that you're on the left here. I'll just go out on a limb and, and guess that. Um, but so I was talking about this with my driver last night. I've heard this now from two drivers um, who both had worked in construction. And so the, yeah, the first job by our standards, by our educated upper middle class standards, it looks like they're being treated terribly, uh, like they're being exploited. Um, but as they both said, well, you know, yeah, that's where you start. But then you know, and if you stay in that job, you may not advance. But then you get a different job, and you get a higher salary. And you become a driver rather than a construction worker. And it's more fun. You get treated better. Um, so this is, this is the nature of the moving up. There are parts of it that are ugly. And this is why capitalism is, is uh, so controversial, because there are aspects of it that are disturbing to our sensibilities. But the overall process is one in which, for the most part, these people are choosing uh, to come to the UAE, for example, because, as he said, you know, life was much nicer in India. He really liked it being with his family. The weather was better. Um, but he made this choice and was willing to suffer bad conditions because he had the chance to advance and send a lot more money home. So that's the trade-off. That's so, exactly the trade-off. Okay. Um, so you were talking about the path dependence and the uh, cultural or... Yeah, the cultural development of someone who go of a culture that goes through industrialization and then the service sector. Mm -hmm. um, now that we have this instance of leapfrogging in a lot of de developing nations, mm -hmm. uh, 
do you foresee the same kind of path dependence in cultural development? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I, I do. Um, um, I mean, culture is, you know, culture is extremely powerful for many of the reasons I, that I was talking about today. Uh, what we perceive is based on, you know, what we, what we believe stru uh, um, shapes what we perceive. Um, and uh, so, um, even with the increased time frame, um, I'm guessing that young people today, um, uh, young people today in more traditional nations are not exactly like young people in the United States. In fact, in this paper, in the uh, Englehart paper, they even say a McDonald's, you know, people are talking about the McDonaldization of society. It's gonna be McDonald's all over the earth. But even if you look at McDonald's in different nations, they're very different, not just in terms of the food they serve, but in the social role that they play. So McDonald's will play a different role in youth culture in the different countries. So I think that development will always be path dependent um, to some extent. Is there a follow up? Yeah, I wasn't wondering if uh, just development after convergence rather that. Rather that, um, that because there's no sort of industrialization phase, that oh, we I won't see. have the oh. lean towards rationality and. Oh, how interesting. I right. see, I see. Yeah, I guess. The Englehart uh, thesis would that would suggest that that if a country skips the manufacturing stage and goes right to a service economy, if you go from agriculture to a service economy, yes, and that might be oh how interesting. So that might be the only way. And actually, I suppose this would be I imagine this would be qu of quite a lot of interest to the leaders of the UAE. Perhaps the only way you you know this quadrant is currently empty. Um, I would imagine that many of these Islamic countries don't want to end up here. Now, they might, you know, they might rather end up here. They might be more willing, because this way you keep traditional values of religion. So yeah, that's a very good, good insight. You, if you skip industry and go straight from agriculture to service, you could do that. Is there ever a country that's done that, that skipped the factories? That I don't know. Singapore. The UAE's doing it? Yeah, Singapore. Okay. But were the people, <coughs> Singapore, did it, did Singapore, because it was all shipping and, and commerce, not factory. Well, there was, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, great, right, great question. I guess maybe we'll know more in 10 or 15 years. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to raise your attention to the fact that all those countries in the upper right corner, the Scandinavians and the Netherlands, mm -hmm. they are far from the pure capitalist model there are welfare states right. with strong redistributive models, charging high taxes mm -hmm. to the rich and redistributing to the needy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, I think that's that's correct. Um, so it's not. I'm I'm not arguing for um, <clears throat> for a complete, uh, you know, free market society with no role for government, no safety net. Um, even Friedrich Hayek, even some of the leading thinkers on the, uh, in the libertarian canon didn't argue for that either. Um, it is at least important to note, as far as I understand it, that some of these countries, especially Sweden, um, had v uh, what you might call what looked like a much more socialist system in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And by the early 90s, it was clear that it was unsustainable. And as I understand it, they made major reforms to get much more dynamism. They were losing their dynamism. So they found ways to increase dynamism, pull back, uh, on entitlements, uh, they still have high taxes. You're absolutely right about that. Um, but um, so I think these are probably, and again, this is why Fukuyama picks them as the most desirable societies, at least from a sort of a Western, especially left of center perspective, these societies are better than these societies. Now, many people disagree, but on the left, and this is the issue in the United States, um, the Republicans think that the Democrats want to turn America into Denmark uh, or Sweden. So. Um, so yes, I, I agree. These countries here have more cutthroat capitalism, and these countries here have more cuddly capitalism is in, in one formulation. Thanks. Uh, you touched on it in, in your answer to one of the earlier questions, but I was just wondering, it, as we look at this data, which talks about the effect of uh, economic development on cultural values, mm -hmm. whether or not there's any data that we can kind of overlay on top of that that talks about the effect of economic development on wellness or happiness absolutely. of the same population yes. and how that might kind of correspond. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. And that's why, as I said, my views about GDP have changed a bit. Um, there's a fantastic report if you Google um, World Happiness Report. 
Just Google World Happiness Report. It's a fantastic report written by three economists, but economists who really take the psychology seriously. Uh, Richard Layard, um, who are the others? Um, um, What's his name? At any rate, it's a great report. And what they do is they report, I, I have it in another talk, they, they show the data on who's, uh, which countries are the happiest. And then they are able to break it down by doing multivariate analyses to what extent does just sheer GDP contribute? And the answer is sub quite a lot. So in regression analysis, putting in everything, rule of law, amount of freedom, um, security, health, wellness, all those things, you put them all in, all of them contribute to the overall happiness score. Um, but all these things tend to move together. Um, so, that, so I think it's actually a very exciting time to be studying social policy, to be thinking consciously about how do we want our nation to develop. Because m now there is so much good data about what happens if you do X and what leads to flourishing, what leads to happiness. There's so much good data, whereas even 15 years ago there wasn't. So um, uh, they do all tend to move together, and I think that's very encouraging. If you, if you do good economic development, you get dynamism with decency, you're going to end up having people who are happier, more law-abiding, more productive, and you get all these nice virtuous feedback loops, which make you even more dynamic. So I think that's to the extent that our nations are all different, but I think if you let each nation interpret what they mean by decency, and perhaps by dynamism, um, and I think there are these multiple endpoints that we can all uh, aspire to.